Welcome back. Um, today's topic is displacement velocity and acceleration in three dimensions. We've learned all about velocity, displacement, acceleration in one dimension. We know that velocity is the derivative of position, and acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. The only thing that's changing is that instead of using one number to describe the position, x, we're going to use three numbers, a vector, x comma y comma z. x, y, and z are functions of time. So the x, y, and z coordinates of the particle are changing in a known way in time. And so to get the velocity vector, it's just the derivative of this vector. And what the derivative of a vector means is that to get the x component of, of the velocity, we look at the way we take the derivative of x. To get the y component of velocity, we take the derivative of y. And to get the z component of velocity, we take the derivative of z. And then the acceleration is similar. To get the x component of the acceleration, we take the derivative of the x component of velocity. To get the y component of the acceleration, we take the derivative of the y component of velocity, and the z component of the acceleration is equal to the derivative of the z component of the velocity. Or a way of writing this as vectors, a equals dv dt. And that is shorthand for all three of those equations together. Now there's also some problems that will ask you what speed is, what the speed of a particle is. Remember that speed is the magnitude of the velocity. When we were working in one dimension, finding the magnitude of the velocity just meant make it positive. But now that we're in two or three dimensions, the magnitude of a vector is given by the Pythagorean theorem. So the speed is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, all under the square root. Notice that's always going to be positive. So here's an example. You've got the, a particle and its position is given, or its x coordinate is given by the function 16 cosine t over 4 pi and its y is given by 16 sine t over 4 pi. If you've worked with parametric functions before, you will probably recognize that this is something moving in a circle. What we want to do are find the velocity and the acceleration as functions of time. So vx is the derivative of x, so dx dt. 16 comes out the front. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. And we also need to take the derivative of what's in the parentheses. So the derivative of t over 4 pi chain rule time is just 1 over 4 pi. Or another way of writing this, just clean it up a bit, negative 4 divided by pi sine t over 4 pi. The y component of the velocity is the derivative of y. Once again, we have the 16. Derivative of sine is just cosine. Once again, we need to apply the chain rule, 1 over 4 pi. And we end up with positive 4 over pi cosine t over 4 pi. Now, the way we would write this as a vector is v is equal to negative 4 over pi sine t over 4 pi. i hat plus 4 over pi cosine t over 4 pi j hat and the units is meters per second. What about the speed or the magnitude of the velocity? Well, we square the x and y components of velocity. By the way, 
look at this a little bit and think, why would I be interested in doing this? We've got sine and cosine. We're going to square both of them, add them together. Hmm. Things are going to cancel. So it's going to be the square root of square vx, which is 16 over pi squared times sine squared of t over 4 pi plus 16 over pi squared cosine squared t over 4 pi. Now it doesn't matter what t is, sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, so this becomes the square root of 16 over pi squared, which is 4 over pi. And that tells us that the speed of this particle is constant, it's just changing directions. It's going in a circle, this is uniform circular motion. Okay, next we need to find the acceleration. So the x component of the acceleration is the derivative of the x component of velocity. So we take the derivative again, we get negative 4 over pi, derivative of sine is cosine, and chain rule gives us another factor of 1 over 4 pi, so we end up with negative 1 over pi squared times the cosine t over 4 pi. Similarly, the y component of the acceleration is the derivative of the y component of velocity. We have that 4 over pi. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. And we have 1 over 4 pi again because of the chain rule. And this comes out to be negative 1 over pi squared times the sine of t over 4 pi. If we find the magnitude of the acceleration, I encourage you to do this on your own. Pause the video now if you need to. Anyway, we get the magnitude of the acceleration. You'll find that it's equal to 1 over pi squared. In other words, the acceleration is also constant in magnitude and changing directions which again is what we expect from uniform circular motion. Anyway, that is how you would apply this in a moderately complicated situation. Last topic for this video, come on computer, there we go, is the kinematic equations. Now once again, we can use the kinematic equations if A is constant. And that means that AX, AY, and AZ are all constant. Now let's suppose that just AX is constant, AY and AZ are not. Well in that case, you can apply the kinematic equations to the X component of the motion, but not to the Y and Z. So the first kinematic equation is a vector equation. So it becomes v equals v naught plus a times t. t is a scalar. Everything else in that equation is a vector. And that means that this becomes three different equations. vx equals v naught x plus ax times t. vy equals v naught y plus ay times t and vz equals v naught z plus az times t. All of those are independently true. Notice that what we did is we just took the x component of every vector that showed up in the equation, and t is a scalar, so it shows up in all of the equations. And then similarly, for the second kinematic equation, which is delta x, and that's a vector, has components delta x, delta y, delta z, equals v naught times t plus one half a t squared. You can break that up into three equations. And the third kinematic 
can be broken up into three equations as well. You know, squaring a vector is a little bit more difficult or a little bit more complicated mathematically, but essentially it breaks up into three equations as well, one for the x components, one for the y components, one for the z components. Result of this is that we say that x and y are independent of one another, meaning the equations for x don't have any y variables in them. The only variable that's shared between these three equations is t, and it's a scalar. So you can describe the x component of the velocity without knowing anything necessarily about the y and z components. And that brings us to the end of this video. For tomorrow, I'm going to check chapter 4, questions 1 and 2.